so. Darren has asked that we take some time. Yeah. Yeah. Take some time. Um, I was going to lead a little meditation at the beginning of the day that got kind of um, set aside. So now let's do that one, okay? Um, so it involves breathing. It involves being comfortable. So make yourself comfortable however you feel comfortable. It involves tears if you want to cry. Um, and I wanted to have everybody put your hands over your heart. Eyes open or closed. Tuning into your breath. Feeling into the love that you have within yourself. As you breathe, feel how this love is connected with the love of those who love you. Each breath, feel this love grow deeper and stronger. Feeling your breath connected with your love. Breathing in and out the love of others. Sinking deep into the heart. As you feel the breath of others mixed with the love of others streaming throughout the universe. Feeling into your body, into this room, into this community, knowing that we all share in each other's breath, in each other's love and support, and sending out gratitude to all those around you who you feel connected to and who you desire to feel more connection with. And closing this brief meditation with three different soundings of the sound awe ah, so that we can feel audibly the sound of love that we've been cultivating. So together. Uh. entitled Americosmos and Psychology 
uh, the empire, the mirror cosmos and the psychology of the empire. And briefly, Darren is an artist, musician, and author of The Four Global Truths, Awakening to the Peril and Promise of Our Times. He's a longtime practitioner and occasional instructor of both the insight meditation and loving kindness practice and a facilitator in the Awakening the Dreamer Symposium, which promotes ecological sustainability, social justice, and spiritual fulfillment. Darren holds a master's degree in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness from CIS. Thank you. So my invitation, my encouragement, is that um, you just remain in this uh, meditative heart space for just maybe one more minute because there's actually a little technical issue. <laughs> have to iron out and, uh, you know. um, so yes, pay no attention to what's going on up here, please. Just um, pay attention to what's going on right here. <laughs> if I just open that, that show up. Yes. There's the connection to it. So I'll just wiggle it. Someone earlier had that problem, Darren, and it was the connection of the wire. Uh-huh. Oh. Very important piece is not plugged in. How to, <laughs> and how to make it go to the full screen. There. Try, try a command F. View and full screen. View. Yeah, view and full screen. That's right. Yeah. Or just double click on it. Slide Slide. Ah, shift command down. Okay, so if I do this, then that would work. Okay. Okay, here we are. You might want to pause it. I think if I take it away from here, it'll, this little thing will go away. Uh, so once again, maybe one more breath to just return to that um, beautiful heart space that it seems almost uh, sacrilegious and disrespectful to move beyond. Um, move beyond, we shall, for the last presentation. And from this space, I want to thank uh, you all for being here. I want to thank the previous presenters who inspired and touched us so deeply. And I want to thank Rand, of course, for um, continuing to carry the torch of this beautiful um, conference. Uh, I was talking with him earlier, and I think this is my um, fourth time here, which means I've been here every year. It's a beautiful blessing. I love the Cosmology of Love conference. Um, and I love you all for being here and for being interested in the cosmology of love. It's a rare thing. So the talk that I want to give today is um, based on an article that I wrote, which is in turn is based on a drawing that I did, which in turn is based, was inspired at least partly from a trip, some realizations that I had, which were born from a trip that I had. So the, the article was written um, probably about two months ago. Um, it has a similar title to this. Um, the drawing was created about three years before that. Um, some of you are going to recognize uh, some, some are part of it. Uh, it was for a class, a Stephen Goodman class, uh, that I took called Buddhist Cosmology. Uh, the realizations go back four or five years before that, before any of this was committed to a drawing form, paper form, a tangible form. Uh, and then the trip that I took goes all the way back to 1999. Uh, so I, at that time, I, I went to India. Uh, as so many do, and I ended up in the north part of India in uh, Himachal Pradesh, outside of Dharamsala, in a place called Norbalinka. Uh, and here is a picture of Norbalinka. 
Uh, it was situated right at the base of the uh, Himalayan foothills, uh, as you can see here. Uh, this is kind of looking into the main entrance. The whole thing is uh, complex, is organized um, architecturally according to the uh, body of Avalokiteshvara. Mm -hmm. So it's, it has this very unique, uh, interesting uh, form to it. When you walk in, this is basically sort of what you see. Um, there are some, uh, these are out of order, I think, but uh, it's okay. We might have to fish around a little bit. Okay, well, some of those uh, didn't show up. Uh, there, you know, so what is Norma Linka? Basically, it's a, um, something of a vocational school. Uh, it's called Norma Linka Institute, and the, um, the aim of Norma Linka is to preserve traditional Tibetan art and culture, which, uh, as many of you know, is sort of at a risk of being lost or diminished because of the um, Chinese occupation, which has been going on since uh, 1950 or so, and which caused the uh, Dalai Lama to go into exile in northern India. Uh, in fact, he lives um, sort of near Norvalinka in, uh, in, uh, up in the upper part of Dharamsala. Um, so, in a, in a weird way, Norvalinka is sort of this cross between a refugee camp and a uh, vocational school. Because most of the people who, who have come to um, study at Norvalinka and learn tra traditional Tibetan arts and crafts from, their, um, from the masters in those traditions um, have all come across the Himalaya through some heartbreaking journey of, of some sort. Uh, in, you know, and, and of course not everybody makes it and everybody has this um, who's there has this story of how they arrived there um, I never got to really delve that deeply into those stories except for the people that I worked with um, Tibetans uh, so this is where I spent about a year um, one of the things that uh, this is the slide that showed up by the way these slides are not my slides there I, I have a big collection of images at home but these are just stuff this is I, I pulled off the web um, they had a doll museum, so that was one of the things that Herbalink was known for, is, is that they had a whole team of craftspeople that would make these dolls with traditional um, uh, dress and so forth. Uh, this is kind of the aristocratic uh, crowd right here. Um, one of my favorite things to see, um, well, let me just mention, they also had, I don't have the slides, but they also had a um, sculpture making um, uh, workshop. They also had, um, uh, clothing, uh, they made clothing as well. They made, um, uh, they had w a woodworking, um, very beautiful uh, woodworking that they would do, very intricate. Um, some of you have probably seen in and around sort of temples and the Tibetan aesthetic. Uh, it's very, very intricate. And maybe some of the slides will show up a little bit later. Um, so, um, and they also had a uh, Tonka painting. Uh, workshop and studio. That was what, uh, in fact, most of the people who were studying Norbalinka um, between the ages of maybe 15 to 30 or so, they study tanka painting. Uh, for those of you who don't know, tanka painting is kind of this iconographic Buddhist art. Uh, and it's very, um, you can see from this picture, very, very meticulous, very, very detailed. Uh, I don't think I have the slides that show the um, mathematics and the sacred geometry that goes into all of this iconography. Uh, it's all very, very specific, very, very formal. Uh, so it takes years and years of study. It's not sort of like taking a painting class as we know it. It's entering into an entire apprenticeship to learn uh, Tonka painting, which takes years and years and years. To become a Tonka master is only realized by very few people. Um, so I was lucky to be a part of uh, being able to at least watch the process as it happened. Uh, tonka painting takes different forms, one of, one of which is uh, representations of the Buddha naturally, that's, uh, that's a big one. Uh, there, there are also, um, there's, I think I had, I had one before, um, that's not showing up again, as the, um, the Life of the Buddha, that's another popular tanka where they show different stages of the Buddha's uh, journey to enlightenment. Um, and uh, mandalas are also very popular, you'll, you'll see these just sort of very elaborate mandalas. Um, Kala Chakra is one, one of the sort of more um, well-known ones. Uh, and th some of them are distinct cosmologies unto themselves. Uh, and there's another one, which is my favorite, which is um, kind of what this talk is partly based around, which is the um, Baba Chakra, which is the uh, wheel of life, the wheel of suffering. Uh, the goes by different names. Um, the uh, essential bit about the Baba Chakra is it is basically a cosmology. And I'm going to sort of go through it really quickly, it, it can get complicated, even though it's meant to be sort of a teaching tool for um, 
young Buddhists and people who are learning Buddhism, it has sort of a lot of the essence of Buddhism is uh, contained in this image. One of the reasons why it's one of my favorites. Uh, it basically depicts um, samsara, the uh, world of cyclic existence in, in Buddhism. And uh, one of the first things I'm sure you'll notice is this uh, fierce, fearsome figure out here uh, who is either Yama or Mara, depending on who you ask, uh, the lord of death, the sort of protector of the threshold. So everything that happened, that everything within this circle that, that Mara is um, holding uh, is samsara. So working from the, from the outside, let's see, from the outside in, um, let's see what, what slides came up here. So, okay. The outer ring is uh, what's called the 12 links of de dependent origination. Now, um, this would be like an hour and a half, no, uh, six months of course <laughs> to take, uh, which I'm not gonna get into and I don't understand, frankly, because it's just one of those, if you kind of understand the 12 links, I think you, you got it, you know, you, you've, you're done. Uh, you know, uh, but uh, within that is a kind of one of the more important parts of the Baba Chakra, the Wheel of Life, the Wheel of Suffering, is um, the six realms. And if you know anything about uh, this particular mandala, you'll you'll know, or about Buddhist cosmology, you'll know about the six realms. And I think I do have that slide. So, um, and ideally, I have the slides that follow this. Uh, at the very top, there is the realm of the gods. Um, the um, what do I want to say about the gods? Um, the gods suffer from, so, so everybody within the circle, you know, maybe different from other cosmologies, the gods themselves are in some sort of um, less than ideal state, let's say. Um, you know, may, it might be suffering light, but they're, you know, they're not, uh, they're not liberated. They're, they're hanging out in here, they suffer from, <coughs> from arrogance and from um, a, um, since all of their sort of pleasures are taken care of, they have very little incentive to do much of anything else except to enjoy themselves, which is, um, you know, in, in sort of Buddhist, uh, as Eric was saying, in, in uh, Buddhist way of thinking, this is um, kind of leads nowhere. So eventually, they when they when they have rebirth, they um, they they're born somewhere else, usually in some lower realm. So then we have the demigods who are always sort of perpetually at war with with the gods. They are um, beings who um, are are incredibly jealous of all the goodness that's over here in the God realm, and they, they, they want a lot of it. Uh, they they want to be like the gods. Um, over here we have the human realm, uh, as uh, we suffer from a variety of things, as you, as you may have noticed. Um, you know, s sickness, old age, death, uh, greed, desire, loneliness, uh, you know, the whole list, um, all of which are sort of centralized around this locus of desire. I think that's the main thing that we seem to suffer from, at least in Buddhist um, thought. Then we have the animal realm. They suffer from uh, you know, being treated cruelly, uh, from being cold, tired, hungry, having to look for food all the time. Um, and that falls kind of under the, 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 the frame of, of ignorance, although that, that's a word that you know, in our culture just has a, kind of doesn't have a very pleasant ring to it. It's just sort of not really knowing the full picture. Basically, that's what, what, what's going on with animals in this scheme. Uh, then we have the realm of the uh, hungry ghosts, or the pretas, and hungry ghosts are beings who uh, wander constantly in search of food and, and um, drink, and they never have enough. They're completely, uh, they're always uh, unsatiated. So they have, um, they're often depicted with this um, really huge belly, and with these tiny, tiny little mouths that they can barely fit anything into. So they're always hungry, but they're, um, you know, they can't get anything in there to satisfy themselves. And then finally, we have the hell beings who are um, going through all manner of uh, uh, unpleasant things, uh, including being pressed by hot sheets of metal and uh, shards of ice, and you know, I mean, you, just basically your worst nightmares. They're not having a good time in hell. Um, so uh, again, all of these are all of the beings in all of these realms are subject to rebirth and, and um, suffering of some sort. Um, So, okay, moving in even further, we have this ring around the center part, which is the ring of karma. And you can see on one side, beings are sort of being elevated to a kind of uh, godlike status, and then through ignorance or other means, they, they sort of fall back down, and you know the cycle sort of begins anew. Um, and then within the central part, this is kind of what I want to focus on in this talk right now, 
is the central part. We have these three creatures, uh, a pig, a snake, and a rooster. Uh, I always get confused which is which. The pig represents <laughs> ignorance, uh, the snake, aggression, and the rooster, desire. Um, and in a lot, of, a lot of times, those three animals are often um, uh, sort of chasing each other. But in this one, it looks like they're all, they're, they're, the snake and the rooster are emerging from the pig's mouth, which is to say that ignorance is at the base, ignorance of our essential nature, as Eric was talking about, our, our, desire, our idea that we are separate and so forth, is from which these other things emerge. So this is, in Buddhist cosmology, this captures the, the, the essence of it. It's all of suffering is because of these three um, tendencies. Um, so that's basically the base break on the Baba Chakra. Um, there's different ways that people have interpreted it in a sort of an ontological way, which is to say that these places, these realms really exist. And when you die, you will go to one of them. And here we are in one of them right now. Um, the other way is to think about them in psychological terms, obviously. You know, uh, each of the each of the realms represents some kind of mind state that we are all subject to at one time or another. Uh, you know, the emotions that I listed, the ignorance, the, fe the fear, the desire. Um, for for hell, being, it's, hell beings, it's anger. So a lot of us can relate to that. It's like anger being the most, the place of most constriction and stuckness. Um, and then another way to in interpret it, which um, I chose to do, is um, in a socioeconomic way. Um, and that's sort of what my talk about talk is, is about today. So when I came back from India, I, I stayed there for about a year, as I said. Um, so I started thinking about this whole Wheel of Life scheme. Um, and when I'm going to be like Aaron right now, I'm going to quote myself. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, this is part of the article that, that I mentioned at the earlier, uh, mentioned earlier. When I finally returned stateside after over a year in the shadows of Shangri-La, my reverse culture shock was profound. Although I had seriously considered staying indefinitely in India, to study Buddhism and perhaps even become a monk, I realized almost immediately why my conscience had called me back. Where once I had perceived only sickening abundance, I now saw abundant sickness and heard desperate cry for help. My former cynicism had mostly morphed into compassion. I had, in effect, been reborn into the realm of my own culture and into a full awareness of the ubiquity of suffering. It's no less present in the McMansions of the Midwest, I grokked, I understood than in the hovels of Himachal Pradesh. In fact, the America of my rebirth seemed even more mired in misery than my, any so-called developing country I had ever visited. As for freedom, I can only recall Goethe's observation that none are more enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. As I settled back into American life, I had the unsettling realization that the whole country was little more than an elaborate prison in which the inmates were also wardens, and the walls made of illusions maintained by an invisible entity I came to call Uncle Samsara. <laughs> indeed, indeed. the more I thought about American culture, the more it seemed like an extreme character of the human condition as depicted in The Wheel of Suffering. The cartoonist in me couldn't resist flushing out the parallels, although it wasn't until years later that I committed the scheme to paper. But when I finally did commit it to paper, it looked like this. <laughs> um, so I mentioned this was, this was for a class with Stephen Goodman called Buddhist Cosmology. Um, and so just like the Baba Chakra, I want to give you a brief tour of it, um, I think, again, from the outside in. So um, this, I've already mentioned Uncle Samsara. He is the um, rules over death, taxes, um, despair, uh, you know, all, all the rest of the exciting parts of American culture. Um, then we move to uh, this outer ring is the, uh, the 12, what did I call it, the 12 links of codependent consumerism. Uh, the sequence begins and ends, and I'm just going to read this. The sequence begins and ends with shopping. Uh, this is up here in the first, uh, the first one. Uh, an activity which leads directly to the accumu accumulation of material objects, possessing lots of stuff, leads to the need for a stuff storage facility commonly called a house, and usually located outside of town. So that's where that poor guy is amongst all of his stuff. Um, this necessitates having a motorized vehicle with which to transport one's person, groceries, and additional stuff that one acquires. Driving a car, uh, so the, yeah, that's the uh, house part. Driving a car uh, necessitates buying gas, which contributes to debt. This gives rise to the need to maintain employment. Working generates stress, which leads to an urgent desire for, okay, I got ahead of myself. He's still uh, in debt here, uh, buying gas. Um, employment, stress, 
uh, an urgent desire to um, <coughs> relax. Uh, this often involves consuming alcohol, consuming alcohol and or watching television, uh, depressants, TV, and advertising all contribute to a sense or a lack, uh, a lack or an emptiness, here symbolized by a black hole. Uh, this feeling of worthlessness leads to an impulse to shop, which begins the cycle anew. Wow. The 12 links of codependent consumerism. Uh, now we return, we turn to the six realms of uh, socioeconomic existence, and you know, I don't have the slide. Just go oh, well. through those last four again, because I think yeah, it, had, it showed it in the last four when you were yeah. looking at. The oh yeah, okay. Right. Okay, yeah, well we can, yeah, we can do it this way. Thank you. Um, so at the top is the imperial realm in which the ultra-wealthy beings live in mansions, ride in limousines, and suffer from arrogance, isolation, and the occasional bad hair day. Below <laughs> that, and to the left, this is the realm of the imperial wannabes. I think we have to go all the way back this way. There's the wannabes. Um, who abide in sprawling <laughs> suburban homes, drive expensive cars, and suffer from envy and existential angst. Uh, to the right of this realm is the public domain, po populated by working class humans. That's us. Wait, getting out of myself again. That's the public domain down there. Uh, working class humans who live in modest homes, apartments, and trailers, and drive used cars. They speak highly of freedom while being severely constrained by desire, fixation, and fear. Many of them, many of us, suffer from high blood pressure, low self-esteem, and bad credit. Lower on the ladder lies the animal turf. Uh, again, that's another side, the animals over there. Uh, wherein many creatures are subject to displacement, confinement, and cruelty on the part of humans. Some of them are kept as pets and often treated much better than beings in the adjacent homeless dimension. Uh, let's see, go back to the homeless dimension, that's over there. Um, this realm is populated by nearly invisible hungry ghosts who wander endlessly in search of food and shelter. The lowest of all realms is the hellish hood, the residents of which suffer from intense anger and psychological illness. Being in this, beings in this realm possess very little freedom, whether they are held captive in prisons, mental institutions, or army barracks. So next we have, um, we can move on to the middle part, the uh, ring of financial karma, in which people slowly climb the ladder to prosperity, only to slide back down into the hole of debt. And finally, there's the inner circle, which again is my uh, focus here in this talk. Um, we see a dollar bill, a tank, and a television set representing um, uh, greed, hatred, and delusion. And institutionally, these exist as materialism, militarism, and the media. Wow. So finally, we have arrived at the heart of the American empire. And we look at these three poisons uh, one by one. Militarism, most people probably know that our country spends more on defense than most of the rest of the world combined. Uh, 2012, the estimates are one between one and 1.4 trillion, trillion dollars, that's trillion. Uh, we have over a thousand military bases in throughout the world. Uh, actually, nobody knows exactly how many we have because the Department of Defense does not uh, let those numbers be available. Uh, U.S. is the also the top exporter of military arms throughout the world by a long shot, something like forty something percent. And the next lowest is like fifteen percent. Um, so it's safe to say we are the most militaristic culture in history. Um, materialism. We can move on to that realm. Um, we can also call it consumerism, but for reasons that I hope will become clear, I choose to call it materialism. Uh, again, familiar statistics, there's, uh, we're 5% of the population, we consume something like a quarter to a third of uh, all the resources in the world. Uh, one American, uh, in terms of consumption, equals roughly 10 Chinese people, 30 people from India, 130 Bangladeshis, and each of one of us consumes about as much as 375 Ethiopians. Uh, we have more shopping malls than high schools, we eat about 800 billion calories a day, which is 200 billion, uh, I mean together, not each of us, um, <laughs> which is 200 billion too much, which could feed another 80 to 100 million people every day. Um, so then we move on to um, the media. So we can also call this the, uh, the civic realm or the um, cultural sphere. This is the sphere of ideas, the sphere that serves to reinforce the uh, other two spheres. So the most prominent uh, forces in this sphere are, of course, advertising, multi-billion dollar industry. Um, in the average household, uh, you know, I chose television, the television set, the average household is these days, uh, TV is on for between some, almost seven hours per day. Um, 
we, uh, you know, there are all the statistics about how many violent acts we watch on TV. So within the TV sphere alone, there's all the reinforcement of the violence and, and the uh, consumerism. Video games are another um, sort of entryway into the violence. Uh, our educational system, of course. Um, one could very easily make the argument that it's, it's little more than a corporate indoctrination system that allows us, that um, feeds us the uh, memes of the corporate culture and I'm running out of time. Um, so the main messages, of course, are here are, um, you know, of course, if you're not, you're not rich enough, you're not cool enough, you're not skinny enough, whatever it is, you need these products to be happy. Uh, and then moreover, fundamentally beneath that, there's this idea that, you know, you are a separate individual, you'll always be marooned in your own consciousness. That's one of the, um, this feeds very well, this works really well for the military industrial media complex. Um, so it might seem like I'm picking on the United States, but I, but I uh, want to say that this whole scheme in, in my thinking is universal. And in fact, not only universal, but it goes back historically to way back when before the actual age even. So we can think about like the cultural centers back then were the t was the temple. In a temple, of course, you would go there to worship, but also there was sex in the temple. There was a temple um, goddess or a prostitute, however you want to look at it. There, there was um, money changing that happened. You remember the story of Jesus throwing the money changers out of the temple? It was the center of commerce. Um, and it was a treasury. And a treasury for what? A treasury for war. So, you know, already way back when, uh, we had the intermingling of all of these different spheres. Um, and uh, I'm almost through. And, um, and we could trace that all the way through the whole colonial period and everything. There's always this union, especially between the uh, mil militarism and the media between commerce and, um, uh, and violence. Uh, so I know all this sounds like pretty bleak, and I don't want to end here, you know, especially it's the cosmology of love, and this has all been pretty bleak, but of course, um, but I'm getting there, and, and it's even more accurate to say we're all, we're all getting there, because as you know, we are in the midst of the shift, the great turning. Uh, Joanna Macy calls it the turning, from, the turning from the industrial growth society to the uh, life-sustaining society. Uh, David Corton uses similar language, but even more simple. He says, we're moving from empire to earth community. Uh, that's the shift that, that we're in. Um, and of course, the change starts here. We have, uh, of course, the antidotes to um, all of these three. So the antidote, of course, to uh, the indoctrination is in inside and empowerment, what we've been calling the new story, or we could call the cosmology of love. Uh, generosity as the antidote for, um, for greed, uh, detachment, the emergence of a gift culture. Uh, you know, I've talked about that before in other talks. Um, compassion, of course, is the antidote to uh, hatred and violence and forgiveness and what that looks like institutionally in terms of not imprisoning people but rehabilitating, reconciliation. Uh, and peace as a global project or as a, as a governmental project. And this whole thing is kind of a, a work in project progress. But of course, you can see in the middle, uh, we're talking about love, essentially, a shift from, from this contraction to this love to a sense of love. So of course, freedom is possible. Um, that's the message of the, of the Baba Chakra, actually. The Buddha is pointing over here to the moon. Uh, and and uh, in mine, it's a little bit different, but there's still a moon. There's a peace symbol. This is all outside of samsara. Uh, and the thing that I want, thought that I want to end with is um, not only just that freedom is possible, but um, it's interesting to me that the, that the archetypal symbol is the moon, because the moon represents the mother, as we know, it represents the mother, it re represents intimate relationships, it represents the home. So what does that tell us? Very interestingly, um, the very first word that we have in any culture for freedom is the word amarki, which is a Sumerian word, and it means return to mother. Mm. This is the very first wow. word for freedom. And then when you look at the etymology of the word freedom, it comes from, it's related to the German root uh, from which comes the word friend. So, so what we conclude is that freedom is the ability, is not the, the idea that we need to go out there and be on our own, it's the ability and the freedom to form connections. That's what freedom is. Mm -hmm. You can think of a slave or a king or whatever, they're just, their existence is defined entirely by relationships of power, not by lateral um, uh, commu community. So freedom is the ability to, um, to um, form community. And um, so I want to say like the, the, this idea of the noble ascetic going off into the wilderness and into a cave and on top of a mountain or whatever, I think it's not only overrated, but I think it's 
it's finished. I think we're over that. We're into this idea that enlightenment is a group project, and so it's a team sport. And so I just want to say, go team. <laughs>